Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. We have a special show, uh, something that I have not done before. And, and I really have been wanting to do this. I have been following a man named Ronald Rawson, Ron Rawson, with his New Orleans Facebook mob oriented pages. He's got several of them. I'll let you tell him about them, but I've got him and and I got on to him. He, he just really goes, he get, finds pictures of the real places. He really goes beyond the myths, beyond the, you know, that Carlos Marcello or Marcello, however you, you want to say it, that, that he once came up to New York City and sat in a meeting with some guys at the La Stella Hotel. He, he, he does a lot more than that about what the, the true culture of the development of the mob in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. So, so welcome, Ron. Hey, thank you, Gary. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Well, we've been Facebook friends for a long time and, and followed each other's stuff. And, and uh, finally, I get to meet you in person. So uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's good to meet you too. Truly is my pleasure. Uh, Ron, tell the fans a little bit about the different pages that you've got. You've got some really interesting stuff down there that you, you post a lot of pictures and, and good solid uh, newspaper uh first primary source information about the uh, mob family in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, okay, well, my original page I started out with in 2015 is uh, uh, Crescent City Mafia Murders and Mysteries. Um, and, and, and I kind of started branching off with other pages because all the information I was finding and collecting and it, it just kind of seemed to, I don't know, kind of um, bottle up you know, in, in, on the on the single page. So I, then I started a, a page called uh, the Bourbon Street P Project, uh, which if anybody's not aware, I mean, Bourbon Street for, for decades was uh, pretty much run by by the, the mobbed up guys in, in, in New Orleans, uh, going back before even Marcello, a guy named Gaspar Gulotta, who was, uh, he, he was connected, his dad, Calagero, was uh, a made guy in the family. Uh, so anyways, I, I started with that and that kind of took off. And then I started a page called Graveyard Gangsters. Uh, that's kind of a side thing here. I mean, the, 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 the tunes of these, some of these guys are, are really beautiful tunes. And, and, you know, just going to where, you know, these guys ended up got to be an interest. And, and then I, there again, you know, I started getting a lot of information on that. So I, I started a page for that. Then Mob Memorabilia. Um, so I started collecting, you know, the stuff from around here. I kept going. How I got into that is I'd go to eBay to get pictures of some of the stuff, you know, like Carlos Marcello's uh, New Southport Club. It, it, and I started seeing these things. and It's like, man, you know, I'd kind of like to have that. And so I started and it just grew into an obsession. I was, I've got a bunch of stuff now. Um, and then uh, I have uh, the... Uh, page called New Orleans Whistles in the Night, and it deals with uh, the David Hennessy incident mainly, uh, but it, I kind of lump in the early uh, 1900s of, of the New Orleans family. Is It, it, it connects up pretty good, um, you know, and it's, it's kind of the mo more the period before Carlos takes over in 47. Now, now, run just run through in a few sentences that David Hennessy incident. It really shows uh, the the place in society of the newly arrived immigrants, uh, the the Sicilian folks that came here looking for opportunity. Yeah, uh, I mean, really, a lot of people think the Hennessy incident is what started all the mafia activity in New Orleans, but it, in actuality, it goes back to the Agnello brothers. Uh, during, you know, right after the Civil War. I mean, it's, it, there was probably activity during and before the Civil War, but the earliest records we can, I can find, or anybody's found it, as far as I know, it goes back to right after the Civil War. But um, the, the Hennessy incident, uh, basically David Hennessy, he was a superintendent of police uh, in New Orleans. Um, there's a lot of theories of why he was killed. Uh, basically, he, he was slated to testify against uh, Charlie Matranga and some others in favor of the Provenzano family who the previous May were thrown in jail for ambushing some of the, the Matranga guys. 
Um, supposedly, new evidence came to light that Hennessy got, and their retrial coming up, uh, I think it was a week after Hennessy was actually shot in October of 1890. Um, he was he was supposedly going to testify in favor of the Provenzanos. The theory is is you know the Matrangas didn't like that and and killed him. Um, so then, of course, after that, uh, the 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 city the city fathers and the and the upper class businessmen and every everything they uh, basically put out um, that you know he was killed by the mafia and and you know they they rounded up 250 Italians they ended up indicting 19 of them uh, trial started in February of 1891 ended. March 13th of 1891, uh, with their acquittal. Three were no finding, uh, and six of them were found not guilty. There was, there was nine Italians put on trial, uh, out of the 19 because the courtroom was too small to fit all 19 defendants. So there was a group of 10 still awaiting trial on Saturday, March 14th, when about a a crowd of 9,000 people or so, stormed the parish prison and they ended up uh, uh, lynching um, the, well, 11 Italians, six from the first group and five still awaiting trial. Wow. Um, and, and that's, that's been the biggest l- single uh, incident of lynching in American history still mm-hmm. up to this day. Now there, there were other bigger, uh, lynchings or not lynchings, but uh, hangings of people that people like to cite, you know, uh, but they were either, you know, incidents that happened over several days or they were actually judicial uh, yeah. sentences carried out. Um, so, but even, you know, uh, from what I understand, I mean, for, for decades, you know, the, 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 the lynching, uh, stayed with the people in New Orleans. You know, the big thing uh, was, you know, Italians are, all, you know, always say that uh, for up until the 20s or 30s, you, you know, people would still, they'd come across an Italian and they'd be still like, who killed a chief, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and so it was now, you know, talking to a lot of the people I work with here and, and uh, a lot of people don't know anything about it anymore, yeah. you know, which is kind of sad. I mean, this is, this is your history, you know. It's you got a Yankee coming coming down to you, <laughs> down telling you this history. But you know, the, at the same time, though, a lot of people when they find out, they they find it interesting. Yeah. You know, so hopefully, you know, some people have dug more into it, you know, um, learned a little more about it. But, so. All right, great. Thanks for uh, throwing us in on that. I knew I knew that story a little bit a little bit about it, and uh, it is interesting. Uh, most people, I would say, mob fans particularly. Uh, do not know that story. I didn't know yeah. it until I saw it on your page. Yeah. And I, I clicked it, on the link. And it's like, oh my god! Yeah, and, and and just like with a lot of the Marcello stuff and what we're going to talk about today, there's a lot of myths out there that <laughs> exactly. just it, it's that's all it is, isn't it? You know? Yeah, we we were talking earlier. We kind of blamed the uh, the supposed uh, his part in the murder of JFK on the fact that there's yeah. so many myths about Carlos yeah. Marcello, but but the first one. Ron, the first one I want to talk about is the one that caught my attention because I have uh, have perpetrated this myth myself one time on my podcast. I, I don't even remember what we were talking about. And I said, oh, yeah, that time that the, the feds, the FBI, just took Carlos Marcello and dropped him off in Guatemala, and he beat him back to New Orleans. And, yeah. and of course, that's yeah. uh, reading your, your Facebook post. I found out that was a total myth. So I want to correct that. And and so tell, her, tell us about... Uh, what happened? What really happened with that deal? Okay. Uh, first, let me say, I don't know how this story of him getting dropped off in the jungle or, you know, even being a, a parachute strapped to him and kicked off the plane, <laughs> how this came about. Because they're, they're, the, the, the newspaper clippings that I found of the day of, of, of telling the story, none of, none of it mentions any of this <laughs> stuff. It, it gives you the true story. And the thing is, is, you know, John Davis's book, Mafia Kingfish, a lot of bad information came out of uh, out of that book. But this is one thing that that Davis got right. You know, 
So it, it didn't come from him. So I don't know where it came from. But basically what happened is, you know, Carlos, ever since 1953, uh, after the Kefauver hearings where he was brought in, he, he took the, uh, the fifth 152 times, I think it was. Um, after that, you know, the, the INS came, came along and, and, you know, his, um, his status as an illegal alien was brought out. INS came along and deportation orders were placed against him in 53. So of course, you know, he was, he was fighting those orders for the whole time. And, and, and I believe, you know, at the time they, they were allowed unlimited uh, appeals every, any time an order came down. So of course, you know, Carlos having the money he did and the lawyers and everything. I mean, he, he had, he, he was able to put it off, you know, and, and he never was deported. Um, so, that, you know, but he had to go in quarterly to check in with INS to, you know, let them know, hey, I'm still here, you know, I'm still an illegal alien, whatever, you know, just <laughs> yeah. check in with them. And uh, so he went in on April 4th, 1961 for a regularly scheduled meeting. He wasn't, as some of the stories go, he wasn't rousted in the middle of the night, taken out of his bed in his pajamas. He wasn't picked up off the street like, you know, a couple of guys, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Stasi or whatever and yeah. thrown into a car. And, you know, he, he went to a regularly scheduled meeting. And basically, as, as I understand it, what happened is they gave him a letter to read saying, hey, you know, we've, we've come to discover that you're a citizen of Guatemala. Now, Bobby Kennedy knew that was bullshit. You know, they knew it was a fake passport and birth certificate. Um, but basically it said you're a citizen of Guatemala and, and, so, and so you're, uh, will be deported uh, immediately. And, and of course, you know, Carlos, he, he had a lawyer with him, which is another part of the story that never gets told uh, a lawyer, which basically, as I understand it, he was kind of house counsel for, for Carlos. Um, his name was Philip Smith. He had an office in the town and country uh, motel office complex where Carlos had his office. Um, and and I, I think from what I can gather, he just kind of basically did mundane everyday things for Carlos. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, uh, you know, so uh, two, I guess two big, huge INS agents came into the, uh, the office there and escorted Carlos and Philip uh, out to a waiting car. Um, he was taken to the airport. Uh, the plane was already started. And they, 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 they ushered Carlos onto the plane with the two agents and uh, they wouldn't let Smith get out to make any phone calls until the plane was in the air. And that's another thing, um, you know, Carlos, he, he wanted to make a phone call to his wife, to his lawyer. Uh, he wanted to get some money. He wanted to get a change of clothes, a toothbrush. They, they told him no, you know, and, and basically, you know, Carlos always said I was kidnapped and, and you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, he kind of was, um, you know, and it was under the guise of, you know, lawfully done and, and all this. But so, you know, the, 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 the really funny myths of this is, you know, once they were up in the plane and they got over Guatemala and I, I heard that this was done to him twice on one show, uh, they strapped a parachute to him and, basically gave him the boot out of the plane. You know, <laughs> That's a good I mean, story though. You got to admit that. <laughs> you know, oh yeah. It's, 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 it's good, good story, but yeah, that's all it is. That was um, probably those FBI. You know, agents, I mean, did, those, FBI agents, those FBI agents, when they got back, they probably told everybody that story. So oh, yeah, we just took, we just went over <laughs> quite a bottle of a parachute on him and kicked him out. We saw, he looked like he opened the parachute. We don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah. Could, could be, you never know. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, 51 year old, uh, uh, guy, they kick him out over junk. It just, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. But what actually happened is, uh, they flew in to, uh, Guatemala city into the airport, but, the, uh, as I understand it, their airport, there was a, a, a portion of it that was military use only. Um, they flew into the military air force base and Carlos was given over to, uh, a Guatemalan Air Force colonel named uh, Antonio Batras. I think I'm saying that right. B-A-T-R-A-S, Batras. Um, 
and and uh, as the story goes, uh, Botcher's told um, Marcello, "Hey, you know, there's a lot of uh, reporters and and outside the gate. Um, what what do you want to do?" And Carlos's response was basically, "You know, I want to I want to get to a hotel somewhere where I can you know um, rest and get something to eat." Well, for whatever reason, it wasn't really made uh, clear. They, they ended up, he landed in Guatemala City about 6 p.m. local time. They, they ended up staying somewhere on the Air Force Base until about 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Um, and the, the nicest, biggest hotel in Guatemala City at the time, anyways, was the uh, Biltmore. Um, apparently, Botchers came back after several hours and told Carlos, hey, there's still a lot of reporters at the hotel expecting you there. What do you want to do? And, excuse me, Carlos didn't want to deal with reporters. So somehow, what ended up happening is Botchers gave over Carlos's uh, um, well-being uh, and, and care to his secretary, who was named Miss Jinx. Uh, they never gave her first name. Um, but she was basically his secretary. She had lived in the United States, so she spoke English and everything. Uh, and the first thing she did was, uh, you know, take Carlos to get something to eat somewhere. Um, I forget the name of the restaurant they went to, but it, by the time they're get done eating and, and, um, get ready to go somewhere, it's like two 30 in the morning. So she says, Hey, you know, uh, we probably could get you into the Biltmore, but there might still be reporters, whatever happened. She says, instead, why don't you just come to my apartment and you can stay there for tonight? So he said, okay. And he gets, he gets to Miss Jenks place and, and, you know, um, she, she says, you know, all he had his suit on. She, she says, if you want some clothes, there's some clothes in, in the wardrobe over there. So he goes and opens it and he sees a bunch of different men's clothes and, he gets to thinking, you know, gee, isn't this a nice setup? You know, he's, he's are they fixing to whack me? You know, uh, <laughs> here I am, stranger from out of the country, with this woman. <laughs> Wouldn't it be just convenient if her husband walked in and shot me? So apparently, as Carlos told it, uh, he had a very sleepless night waiting for for somebody to come in and and clip him. But. Uh, if, Obviously, that never happened. So the next morning, um, he had uh, his uh, he had Miss Jenks call his wife here in Metairie, um, and and you know she connected you know with the uh, the Spanish operator and everything. And once they connected, he got on the phone, told his wife and kids, you know, I'm I'm good. You know, this is what's been happening. Uh, I'm going to this hotel. Blah 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 blah. Um, so later that day, yes, he got into the Biltmore and everything and, and was able to, to relax. Um, the first day or so, he, 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 he was kind of ducking the authorities, the uh, immigration authorities in Guatemala, because they, they, they had made statements, public statements, that if his uh, paperwork is false, he'll be arrested. Um, so... It, what, what doesn't make a lot of sense to me is while, he, while back here in, in Louisiana, his, his, his lawyer, Jack Washerman, was telling the government, hey, these, uh, these Guatemalan papers are false. You know, you deported him under false papers. And I guess maybe Carlos, in, a, in an effort to avoid being arrested there in Guatemala, he, he later that day, he went to the Guatemalan authorities and said, yeah, here's, here's my paperwork. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's legit paperwork. So here, you know, Carlos is saying, yeah, this is, this is legit stuff down here while they're saying it's fake back there. Mm -hmm. And, and, and apparently the authorities, you know, at the beginning, they, they just accepted it. It looked proper, you know, it's like, okay, well, you're good to go, Mr. Marcello, you know, have fun, <laughs> you know? Um, but it, it comes out later that, um, Carlos had some, some ties with some higher up politicians, 
Um, and of course, eventually Carlos is, is deported from Guatemala also, which I haven't got into that aspect yet. He spent about a month in, in Guatemala. Um, so like, like I said, you know, when I started doing that series of posts, um, for a couple of years, I've had all this information, but like you were saying earlier, you know, life gets in the way and, 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 yeah. and something comes up. And so I, I, I've been wanting to do this big story and post and, and a story in the NCS of the whole thing. And it's like, man, that ain't going to happen this year either. <laughs> I just started doing these little bits of it. And right now I've gotten to the point where, uh, you know, Carlos is arrested uh, on April 21st, which would be Wednesday, uh, April 21st, 1961. He's arrested uh, in Guatemala for having false papers. It takes him another couple of weeks to actually deport him out of the country. But uh, and, and though I know the, the basic story of what happens after April 21st, I don't know all the details yet because <laughs> I just haven't had time to go through all right. all the information. <laughs> I understand. You know? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, in, in the days after, you know, he's told, oh, you're, you're, you're good to go, you know, enjoy Guatemala and everything. He, uh, he has um, his wife, Jackie, his daughter, Florence, I believe, comes down, uh, his brother, Sammy and Vincent, um, and his son, Joe. Uh, they all fly down to Guatemala with them. This is this is uh, within the first week he's there. So, you know, all those stories about, oh, Carlos, he spent three days in the jungle before yeah. he could call his wife. And it's all crap, you know. Uh, uh, and his lawyer, Mike Morone, uh, he, he comes down also. Um, so there, you know, I mean, there's even a picture, uh, which is in one of the posts there. There's even a picture of Carlos, his son, uh, Joe and his uncle, I don't, I'm not sure if he's actually a blood uncle, but his uncle, Felice Galino, uh, at a racetrack in Guatemala City. So, you know, I mean, he wasn't walking through the jungle. Um, so, but, you know, like I said, that's, that's, that's about all I got right, all right now. Pretty much uh, it. Know, he, he, um, he made his way back. I would imagine all he had yeah. to do was catch a, some kind of a plane and it gets a boat or something and get back to the United States. Yeah. Hey, you know, I don't know what you guys are talking about. That ain't me. This is their yeah. papers who I am. I'm a illegal, well, but I got papers that I'm illegal. And Yeah. Yeah. And, and but, of course, yeah. we know everything was different back in those days. It is. Oh, yeah. No computers. Oh, yeah. Uh, fingerprinting was, was relatively new. Uh, guys like this were... You know, they had political connections. And, and oh, yeah. We had these Chicago mobsters that basically the Attorney General of the United States, Tom Clark, helped them get out early because they helped Harry Truman get elected president in 1948. So so yeah. it was a lot different back then when it came oh, to yeah. that level of, of uh, operation and, and polit politicians yeah. and governmental, uh, you know, bureaucrats that ran the immigration, the INS or whatever they called it back then. So it was, it was different back then. I could see where yeah. they just take a little vacation and come home. <laughs> well, you know, to let, let, let me say that, you know, Carlos, he had business dealings in Guatemala. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he imported tomatoes. Of course, he's known as the tomato salesman. Yeah. So he, he imported tomatoes from Guatemala. He imported weed from Guatemala. Uh, and he also had interest in the shrimping industry in Guatemala. In fact, his uncle, Felice Colino, um, had a, a fleet of, of shrimping boats that shrimped in the, the waters off of Guatemala. Uh, he was based in Patterson, Louisiana, um, but he had this fleet that, that had business down there. Um, and... Just as a basic run through of what happened after he was deported out of um, Guatemala, he, he was deported into El Salvador. Um, and he stayed there for a few days. And then he, he was at a military camp. He stayed there for a few days and, and some El Salvadoran military commander came in one day. And, and by this point, he's with Mike Moran. His family has left. Gone back to come back to Louisiana here. He's with his lawyer, Mike. Um, they're together. They're in El Salvador. A uh, 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 officer comes in and says, 
you're going to be deported now to Honduras. <laughs> so get your stuff together. You got five minutes or whatever. <laughs> so they, they, put them, they put them on a bus. And according to the stories, this bus goes in to Honduras up through this mountain path, this real, you know, kind of as you see in a movie where, you know, it's a drop off, you know, sheer drop off, you know, down this <laughs> yeah. mountain and oh, yeah. the road, <laughs> this bus is just chugging up. And apparently when they got about 20 miles into Honduras, they're still in the middle of this mountain range. They uh, stopped the bus and they put Carlos and Mike off the bus and say, Here, here's your stop. You know, <laughs> and, and so that's where the walking through the jungle thing okay. came from. All right. It did actually happen, just not in the way that all the myths right. tell you. Um, they ended up walking 17 miles down this mountain they they had reached a village they got a couple of uh, uh local guides to take them in into a town um about 17 miles down this village and, and i guess at one point the uh guides you know started kind of acting a little hokey you know and mike and carlos they weren't feeling too good about their chances of actually <laughs> seeing civilization again so they 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 uh at the, the first good chance, Mike and Carlos, they decide to, to get away from them. They drop behind and they, they kind of fall down this kind of sloping drop in, in, in the, the side of the mountain to get away from these guys. And that's when Carlos broke, uh, it, it, the story's very, it's either two or three ribs. Mm. Um, and, uh, but they, they ended up making it to a town in Honduras and, I kind of lose track of what happened after that. They, they apparently they slept for a couple of days and you know, this is, I, I don't know, I guess the middle of May or so it, it, in a couple of weeks, they make, um, well, Mike Marone, he flies back to Louisiana. Carlos is on his own by this point, but in a couple of weeks, he makes it back into the States. Now, again, you know, it's uh, it's uh, different versions of how he makes it back. I've heard yeah. he came in on a private plane flown by David Ferry, uh, private plane flown by Barry Seal, <laughs> private plane, uh, commercial flight, uh, shrimping boat, you know, from probably, you know, Felice's shrimping one of his yeah. boats. So there, there is right now, as I understand it, there's a book in the works. Um, by somebody and it's supposed to be in con uh, collaboration with Joe Marcello, his son. Mm -hmm. However, I heard that Joe Marcello is denying he uh, ever went to Guatemala. So, you know, I, at first I was kind of like, well, now we're going to get the real story on things. Yeah. But yeah. now after hearing that, I'm kind of like, you know, well, are, are we going to get the story on <laughs> really? things, you know? So, but, well, separating the myth from the fact is kind of hard to do with some of these mob guys. I know that. Oh, most, yeah, yeah. Most of us would rather believe the myth because it's a lot sexier and more romantic than the oh, fact. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of times it is, yeah. It sure I, is. I know. I have people ask me about, well, what was it like, you know, following those guys around and working on the mob? Well, it was a lot of boring, long, boring <laughs> hour, mind-numbing hour, just sitting and watching nothing. And, and then you'd have like about five minutes of a little flurry of activity, write down a few license plate numbers, and, and then go back and call the FBI and say, oh, yeah, oh, you saw that guy over there? Oh, thanks a lot, man. Uh, we never <laughs> put them together before. That, but this make, that makes sense over here, over there. Yeah. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. interesting. All right, we have been here about 40 minutes. So, uh, Ron, I appreciate it. Now, would you come back one of these days and you've got some more uh, stories, uh, kind of myth busting stories uh, from what you said about the bank robbery and the grocery store robbery? Is that, that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. Just uh, real quick, I mean, anybody that's read Mafia Kingfish, they know the story of, of Carlos robbing the bank. And uh, the bank being happy to get their money back that they didn't press charges. That's yeah. a bunch of crap. And then the story about uh, um, the uh, Carlos becoming uh, known as Fagan because he used a couple of kids to rob a store. That's kind of got some factual stuff in it, but a lot of details were left out.
But uh, yeah, I'd I'd be happy if you're willing to have me back. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to come back and talk about them. Uh, you know, any and 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 any anything New Orleans, I'm I'm happy to talk about. Uh, you know, of course, Carlos Carlos is the guy we got the most information about. You know, because he was the most public and and went yeah. through so much. And um, but you know, I, I'd love to you know get into some of the other guys too. You know, before Carlos and even while Carlos was around, because that's another myth. Everybody thinks Carlos is here doing everything by himself. Yeah. That's in no way true. I mean, there was <laughs> a bunch of other guys. There there was a lot of people think, oh, it's hype. You know, New Orleans only had 20 people. Well, no, they, they had more than that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to talk about anything. Yeah, he probably had a, a whole, like Kansas City, they have a whole lot of huge extended network of professional thieves and uh, – boosters and yeah. uh, uh, burglars and, and jewelry thieves, the guys that specialize in hitting the jewelry stores and the jewelry salesmen. Yeah. And he had that old extended, just like in Kansas City, there's maybe 10 or 15 made guys, but boy, the, their tentacles extended way much further yeah. than that. I'm yeah. sure it was the same way. Now, yeah. One last quick question, I guess. Now, how close was he to Santos Trapicante? They're, geographically, they were pretty close, but it seemed like I don't really hear anything about them doing business together or anything. Well, I, I, you know, that that's one of the subjects I've kind of been meaning to dig more into, kind of like, you know, the Kansas City connection. Cause yeah. I, I've heard a lot about Kansas City guys coming down here. And you mentioned uh, before we started this about the Luna, you know, being right. married into the Rizzuto family here. Um, but, yeah, Traficante is one of the things I've been wanting to dig more into. But what I what as I understand things right now, uh, yeah, they, they didn't really – as far as I know, have a lot of business together. Um, but uh, Traficante, he came to New Orleans a lot. Um, and there were, um, there was at least one one guy here, one made guy here, um, who Carlos made, uh, called, uh, a guy by the name of Nino Lascalzo. And he was, uh, he was the nephew of, was it Joseph Lascalzo, who took over from from Traficante after uh, he died. Yeah, I can't remember. I, I can't remember his first name, but he, he took over, uh, and he he was he was uh, the, Nino was his nephew. Oh. So Carlos made him into the the uh, New Orleans family, I, as I understand it, as kind of like a favor. Why what, all the circumstances around that? I'm not. I don't have. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, they they were they were close. Um. But yeah, I, I've never, I, I've never dug up any, you know, concrete information of anything they were involved with, with each other as far yeah. as business stuff. It's kind of um, like, uh, kind of like with Kansas City, they were close. Uh, the brother of our underboss, Frank Delano, was married to a Rizzuto, uh, who was, you know, one of the under underlings, shall we say, of Marcello back then. But I, I don't know of any real business they were doing together, but they had some kind of a connection. There's yes. no doubt about that. I just, I don't know if anybody ever got into what kind of business they had. And it may go all the way back to like the uh, the video poker machines that Gagliano and they've gotten trouble for. So about the same time they had, Kansas City family had a whole bunch of those video poker machines. Oh, okay. Throughout the whole city. Uh, in Kansas City and, and before all of a sudden somebody like you know word starts leaking out that hey you know there's there's machines that you can you know make money earn money on all over the yeah. city it's like a casino yeah. and pretty soon it starts leaking out you start hitting these joints and truck stops like oh man they do yeah. they got, they're all over the place and finally yeah. the bureau works it up yeah. so I can see that being a connection there because uh, yeah yeah I, I, I yeah I never did find find anything you know concrete you know as far as business dealings with with kansas city either you know yeah. it's a, a little little rumors and in, in, in my page too I, i've got a lot of um uh, uh retired cops that you know remember a lot of this stuff yeah and uh you know they've they've kind of hinted at you know yeah there was business dealings between them but there's never any details you know yeah. which i don't know if they knew the details or and they're not just not saying, or they don't remember the details, but, <laughs> but you never know. I mean, th you know, there's, there's stuff I've been wondering about for years. And then all of a sudden the right person comes along and yeah. sees the right question. Yeah. And I'll, I'll go for weeks without any info. And then all of a sudden I get a flood <laughs> of info and it, you know, it just seems to go that way. So maybe yeah. at some point, you know, you never know. Yeah. You, know, you never know. Can all, all right. be made clear. 
Ron, I really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, helping enlighten the guys, my friends who listen to Gangland Wire. I have a bunch of them out there. And, and you guys, I hope you appreciate this, uh, Ron Rosson. And, and take a look at his Facebook pages. You may not, a lot of people are anti-Facebook, it seems like, anymore. But, but there's a lot of really interesting mob stuff out there. And he has some of the more interesting mob pages with uh, some really good, solid information. I highly recommend you go out and search those out. Thanks a lot, Ron. All right. I appreciate you having me, Gary. And uh, I hope we do this again. This was we, fun. We will. Thanks, Ron. All right. Thank Bye. you, Gary. Yeah. All right. Okay. Bye.